Hello and welcome to the webinar on how to plan for marketing your organic products by Susan Smalley of Michigan State University, co-hosted by eOrganic and North Central SARE. My name is Alice Formiga and I'm the webinar coordinator for eOrganic. eOrganic is the Organic Agriculture Community of Practice with Extension.org. We're a community of cooperative extension service personnel, researchers, ag professionals, organic certifiers, and practitioners. You can find all our published articles and videos on organic farming on our website at extension.org slash organic underscore production. Hello everyone, I'm glad to be with you today. This is Susan Smalley. As Alice said, I retired this summer from Michigan State University where I worked for many years as an extension educator and extension administrator and most recently as director of the CS Mott Group for Sustainable Food Systems here at MSU. Um, during my time at MSU, I got really interested in farmers markets initially because of the benefits for both the farmers and the consumers who shop there. And I've worked to learn everything that I can about marketing through farmers markets and other direct local marketing channels. I'm looking forward to sharing with you today some of what I've learned over quite a few years. We've scheduled plenty of time for questions and discussion during this time together, and I hope that you'll share ideas, too, that you found that have worked well for you. I'm still here. I'm waiting for the slide to change. There it goes, and I think we... There I am, and that's, who, that's who's talking with you today, and it's going to take me just a minute to get used to the time, even though I was warned that it takes to change these slides. I guess it's a long way from where I am in Michigan into uh, wherever, the, uh, wherever you're watching us. <coughs> and I'm experiencing a little bit of a challenge right now with getting to the right place. Alice and John, I don't know if you can hear me, but um, here we go. I think I'm back. I don't know what happened there, but we'll keep going. Okay, Susan, I, you, should, you should be able to click. Okay, sorry about that, Susan. You should be able to just click on your screen and advance the slides. Thank you. If you can't, let me know, and I'll make it work. We're okay. not advancing, so next slide, please. Okay. Okay, folks, sorry for that glitch. We'll go ahead and Alice will help us go forward. Um, I thought we'd start first by thinking a little bit about what a marketing plan is. And uh, if you're like many people I know, when you say plans, your eyes just kind of glaze over. But a marketing plan is something that's really important. It's part of your overall business plan, and it's strategic. That means it's setting the general direction and goals for your business and helping you to decide the best way that you can allocate scarce resources like money and time. Um, I think it's important that you write a marketing plan. You may have all kinds of good ideas carried around between your ears, but writing something down helps to cement those ideas in your brain. It makes a, a commitment on your part. It lets you share your ideas with others, and it helps you keep focused. Once you write it, don't stick it away in a drawer, but post it someplace where you can see it regularly. And if things change, feel free to change the plan. It's a guideline. It's not uh, setting concrete, but it's to help you focus over a period of time. It's something for you to really use. Now, even though a marketing plan is strategic, it's also practical and functional because you have to think through what you need to do in order to achieve the objectives that you set for yourself. Um, what marketing activities will you take on? And Perhaps most importantly, your marketing plan outlines ways that you communicate with your customers, the ways you communicate your unique value proposition with your customers. That means the way that your products and your services benefit your customers and why their value is well worth the price that you charge for them. Next slide, please. Now, 
there probably are lots of ways to write marketing plans, and certainly each one is going to be unique, and it has to fit the person who's developing it and their business. But I suggest these components for a business plan. At the very beginning, start out by reminding yourself what the mission or the purpose of your business is. Why are you doing what you do? What overall message do you want to communicate to your current customers and your prospective customers? Next, I think it's time for a market and a customer analysis. This is where you define your market, the universe for your sales. And you do some market research to analyze your competition and determine the segments of the market that, uh, that will be your target markets, the groups of people that you think are your best and most likely customers. Then come marketing objectives. And these are goals. They provide ways for you to measure your progress. Then specific marketing activities. Here's, what you, here's where you decide what specifically to do. Last but not least, I think it's important to have a marketing budget and a schedule. A budget should cover both dollars and time, because both of those are scarce resources for every farmer that I know. You'll estimate the dollar value and time costs to do the marketing activities that are in your plan, and make a calendar or a schedule um, at least month by month so that you can see where you're going to fit in those uh, activities in the course of a year. Next slide. Now, if you've ever studied, studied marketing at all, you have probably heard of the four P's of marketing, sometimes called the marketing myths. We're going to look at those and also talk about a fifth P. The first P is product, and that includes tangibles and services um, that you may sell. Next, please. Next is price, and all that is is the way you assign value to your products and services. Um, I like to think of it as the way we keep score. The higher the score for a product, the higher the price someone's willing to pay. Our third P is place, and that's not just where your products are available, but also how they got there, and I think to some extent when they got there as well. The next P, next please, is promotion. And that includes the persuasive efforts that we use to make the sale, um, how you get customers to come to you and to purchase. Um, these were the traditional ways, and this is what most people think about when we talk about marketing. And then last, and even though it's non-traditional, it's really important, I think, um, a fifth P is people. My Michigan State University colleague, Dr. Bridget Behe, insists that we add this fifth P. And since everything we do in marketing really relates to people, our customers, it is really important. Now, in the next slide, which we can go to now, we'll look at the components of the plan in a little bit more detail. Now, you may already have a mission or a purpose for your farm business. But if not, I think that developing your marketing plan is the perfect time to develop one. Let me give you just a few examples. Um, one example might be for a family of three running a year-round farm based on sustainable production and business practices. That's the mission of a farm very close to where I live. Another one might be our family farm, our family farms to continue the long tradition of the multi-species New England farm, home, farm homestead. Another one might be our vineyard produces specialty crop, specialty grapes for local winemakers. So. Your, your mission is just a very succinct statement of why you do what you do, and it helps to tell customers a little bit more about you and about your business. And it's pretty important because it's kind of the core of your being as a business. Next slide, please. Um, we mentioned the marketing objectives, and um, I've given you a few here to, for you to think about, and of course you have to adapt them to your needs. But they do represent specific goals and one way to measure your progress from year to year. Um, you've probably heard about something called SMART goals. Well, these are SMART objectives. And the letters of SMART make us remember that they should be specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and timely. So for example, a marketing objective might be an annual sales of whatever figure is appropriate for you. It might be a goal to expand your winter sales by a certain percentage. It might be the number of new customers you add to your email list, the increase in the average purchase price at the farmer's market, a CSA renewal rate that's better than what you do now. Those are just some examples. You can set what's most meaningful to you. The important thing is that you have a way that you measure your own progress. 
so that you can tell how much progress you're making from one year to the next and where some changes might need to be made. Next, please. Okay, we're talking about people here, and we're going to start with that, uh, that uh, fifth P, even though we talked about it last, we'll discuss it in detail first. People have to do with your market. Think about that market. Um, what is the universe that you sell in? Um, for direct marketing, we typically define that geographically. It might be a three-county area. It might be the area within 100 miles of your farm. You decide what that area is, what's realistic for you and for your market, what works best for you. After you define your market area, you can start to think about the people who live, work, and travel there. You can use U.S. Census data, Market Maker if you have access to that, and other free tools that are available online to develop a picture of the people within your market. The kinds of things you want to know about them include how many are, are there, what's the population, and how is that population distributed within your market region? Who are those people? What are their ages, their incomes, their education, their household size, their race, their ethnicity? What do they need? What are their limitations? What are their challenges? And you may say, well, how the heck do I know what their limitations and challenges and needs are? Well, I think that based on some of that earlier information, like who they are, you can start to think about if you're, for instance, if you're in an area where your population is aging, that's going to be kind of different overall than an area where the population is young adults and young families, and the needs will be different. So it's important that you understand what your market is like because your business needs to reflect the needs and the opportunities within your market. Part of this whole analysis, too, is to think about your competition. Now, your competition certainly includes other farmers, but it's not limited to them. Depending on the type of operation that you have, your competition might include supermarkets, specialty food retailers, farmers markets, farm and roadside stands, CSAs, recreational venues, and even more. Your competition is really all the other ways that your customers and potential customers have to spend their time and money. So, Think about who your competition is, your most important competition, and take some time to very honestly try to compare your business to the business of your competitors, your key competitors, from your customer's standpoint. Where do you have advantages? What do you do especially well, better than your competitors? And what do they do better than you? This is a really good place to talk to some other people. Talk to some of your best customers and see what they view the market as. It's important that you understand this so that you can capitalize on your strong points and work to improve any points that may be weaknesses for you. Um, then it's important also to consider overall market trends. One of the trends right now that's pretty important, I think, and we'll talk about briefly later, is just the, the downturn in our economy and what that has to say to you and to your customers and what impact it's likely to have on your business. There are certainly other market trends. Certainly, um, many of us have benefited over the last number of years with the, uh, the growing interest in green products, and that's a trend that's still with us, but modified somewhat by the economy. So what trends do you think are going to impact your business? And finally, but certainly you know, not, not, not the least, is who are your customers? You've looked at your market, so can you take what you know about the market in your business and start to segment that market? That is, divide the market up into groups of customers that share some things in common. For instance, um, a couple of groups that you might think about is maybe one of your customer segments that's really important to you is uh, baby boomers who are health conscious. That might, that's a good example. It's a segment that's identified both by demographics, the age, and also by some psychographics, the interest in health. Another one might be, another segment you might want to think about would be parents of young children. Um, those are just two examples, but thinking about your customers in ways that you can kind of group them together will help you when you're trying to figure out what your messages are and how to reach those customers. Next slide, please. So if we're looking at the overall marketplace and still thinking about people, it's pretty important, I think, to understand a bit about why people buy organic. 
Um, an article last year in the Journal of Renewable Agriculture and Food Systems reviewed and summarized over 20 years of research on the consumers of organic food. The authors found some general consensus about three main reasons that people say they buy organic food. The first of these is personal health. Now, you probably know, as I do, that the scientific research hasn't consistently supported the nutritional superiority, that is, the vitamins, the minerals, and the nutrients um, of organic foods. Uh, there was a review commissioned in 2009 by the Food Standards Agency in the United Kingdom that showed no important differences in the nutrition content or any additional health benefits of organic food when they compared it to conventionally produced food. The researchers there reviewed all the papers published over the past 50 years related to the nutrient content and the health differences between organic and conventional food, and um, looking, looked at differences in nutrient levels and the significance of those differences, as well as the health benefits. And they concluded that a small number of differences in nutrient content were found to exist, but they're unlikely to be of any public health relevance. Their review indicated that there was no evidence to support the selection of organic over conventionally produced foods on the basis of nutritional superiority. Now, it's important to remember that conducting research comparing health benefits of organic versus conventional is really, really difficult. Organic farming systems, because they tend to be more site-specific, are generally more variable than conventional systems, and so short-term comparisons aren't too likely to provide any meaningful information. And then the specific factors in each farm's management system, whether it's organic or conventional, that may fall outside the factors that organic standards govern can have a major impact, too, on the products. And we know that crop varieties respond differently depending on the environmental conditions. All that to say is that that whole personal health issue is a very challenging one to look at scientifically. But we know that many people are motivated by health to purchase organic. Some of them are proactive about health issues. For example, parents of babies and young children may begin to purchase organic foods, or those health-conscious baby boomers like me may turn to organic as they try to maintain good health later in life. Other people might not be as proactive, but they may react by purchasing organic in a way, to, as, for instance, as part of a treatment for a serious disease. So it's important for you to understand the motivations of people in those groups and others when they're thinking about organic as healthy. Um, the second major reason why people purchase organic is product quality, and that's often related to better flavor and greater freshness. Now, you know, if you're a farmer, that those qualities can be impacted by many factors beyond the distinction between organic and conventional, and the factors that often you as a grower can influence. So knowing the product quality is a real motivator um, needs to motivate you to keep your product quality as high as you possibly can to keep those customers coming. Third, environmental concerns are also a big motivator, and certainly you have a good story to tell there as you help your customers understand the way you produce food and why, that, why those forms of production um, are good for the environment. What do your customers say about their reasons for buying food from you? It's, uh, it's important that you understand your specific customers and what their interests are. Next, please. Now, we've talked about why people buy organic food, but another question is who buys organic food? And again, there have been, there's been a lot of research on this, and most of it shows that all demographic segments purchase organic food. There are slightly higher rates for people who are more educated, females, um, people who are more affluent, and people with young children. But those aren't big differences, they're just slight differences. I think perhaps more important for us to think about a bit is that buying organic food is really a two-stage decision. The first part of the decision is somebody has to decide where they're going to go to shop. As you know, many places now have some organic foods, which is quite a different situation than 10 or 15 years ago. So deciding where to shop is a first major decision. Once the customer or the consumer gets to wherever they've decided to shop, then they have to decide what to purchase. So as you think about your marketing strategy, don't forget that you've got to first get people to decide where to come. Is it to your stall at the farmer's market, to enroll in your CSA, to come to your, your farm market, um, whatever. So you have to get them to come where you're selling, 
and then once they're there, you have to get them to purchase. Now, the more recent statistics show us that somewhere in the neighborhood of 75% of all shoppers purchase at least some organic food. That sounds like a lot. It's also important to remember that probably in the neighborhood of 20 to 25 percent of shoppers account for most of the organic sales. And that's um, not too unusual, so we'll have some really poor shoppers as well as some who are occasional shoppers. Think about your own customers. Uh, how, how much of your business do your best shoppers account for? If it's a lot, then you might want to think about some special ways that you can uh, help them to continue their shopping and perhaps even increase it. Next, please. Now, another thing that we found out from some of the consumer research that's gone on recently is that, in general, people are really confused when it comes to organic. Um, at least two of the major consumer research companies, Nintel and the Hartman Group, have recently surveyed consumers about their perceptions of organic food. They both found considerable confusion. Part of this is because the whole notion of organic kind of is evolving and it's always changing. Now, that doesn't mean that the organic standards are always evolving and, it, and uh, changing. It means that people's perception of organic is changing over time. Um, the whole the concepts of organic and natural and fresh and local and fair trade and carbon footprints and green and clean all kind of um, swirl around in people's heads for the most part. Now certainly there are those people who are very clear on what each of those means, but that's not the, that's not generally the case with consumers. They're kind of mixed up. According to the Hartman Group, um, people. Um, understand organic certification to uh, encompass many product attributes. We, they see organic and natural as complementary, that they, that they go together. Um, consumers understand organic as pertaining to something that happens to food at its origin, farms, plants, and animals. And in, in their brains, conceptually, the notion of organic makes a product more natural. And as, as the notion of organic becomes more mainstream, it's also lost some of its original meaning for a lot of consumers. Um, what do they think about natural? They understand natural is what happens to the food after it's grown. And a lot of people are skeptical about natural, as perhaps they should be. A concept that seems to have a lot of traction with many consumers these days is that of clean. In the research that the Hartman Group did, they found that clean goes beyond organic and natural, and for consumers, it encompasses a wide variety of attributes that communicate quality to them. Um, and it's symbolically associated with fresh, safe, local, healthy, and um, associations that of being less processed and no chemicals and nothing artificial. Now, you know that there's no standard for clean as there is a standard for organic. However, the notion of clean, if it's that powerful with consumers, may be one that you want to try to incorporate in some ways into the, the conversations and the communications that you have with your customers and potential customers. Next, please. I wanted to share just this one um, graph with you. This comes from Nintel research conducted in fall of 2009. And they were asking people about their understanding of the terms organic and natural. You can see at the top that of the consumers they surveyed, they surveyed about 2,000 consumers uh, with a web survey in fall of 2009. 45% uh, of them thought that they could trust the term organic when they saw it on labels. And 30% of them uh, didn't know if they could trust that or not. The figures were a little bit lower for trust for natural. But then look at that one in the middle. 28% um, of consumers thought that organic and natural meant the same thing on labels. And although about two-thirds knew that products labeled as organic had to meet a government standard, um, almost that many thought that products labeled as natural must meet a government standard. Um, the only point of this is I think it does show what confusion exists out there and the important role that you play as you interact with your customers in helping them understand what some of those terms mean. Um, and I think that can be a really important uh, take home for you in terms of marketing. Next, please. 
Another area that is, uh, I think, a, a useful thing for us to think about is what the Hartman Group calls eating occasions. As we think about people, it's important to recognize that kind of our traditional breakfast, lunch, and dinner no longer represent typical eating patterns for most people. Based on ex extensive research, the Hartman Group uh, says that instead of thinking about meals, we should think about eating occasions, and they identify a few basic types but instrumental eating occasions that are about 59% of all the eating occasions that we have, aren't the ones, they're not so much about the food, but they're more about eating to get things done. They can be enjoyable, but the enjoyment comes more from the social context than it does from the food itself. And food for those 59% of all eating occasions is pretty often purchased by price and probably by habit as well. Um, coming in second are eating occasions that Hartman calls savoring eating occasions. They're the ones where we eat for the sake of pleasure and enjoyment. A good meal out, a birthday party that's uh, got special foods for the family, things like that. And third, by a long ways, representing less than 1% of all eating occasions are the ones that Hartman calls inspirational. Um, I like to think of them as kind of peak eating experiences. You know, that meal that you'll never forget that made you love XYZ food forever and ever and ever and makes you want to try it again sometime. Now, these eating occasions are even more varied when you think about the fact that any one of them can occur either someone eating alone or with other people in different places um, and uh, what time, things like that. So. Think of all the possible, think of the eating occasions in your own life over the last week, and I bet you'll come up with more than you would imagine. Why is this important? Well, if we're selling food, we're probably not going to want to sell food thinking about it for breakfast, lunch, or dinner, but thinking about the eating occasions that those foods might help to make special. Next, please. We spent a lot of time on that first P of people, but we're ready to move on now. The second P is product, and that's really at the core of what you're doing. So we need to think about product mix. That has to do with what you actually decide to grow and sell. What do you offer, and how much do you try to sell? Um, is, it a, is it a narrow line? Is it a broad line? Um, each of those can, can be successful in different situations. Product decisions include how you process the product. Do you wash it? And how do you package it? Bulk, single, mixed, um, special packaging, non -pa no packaging. What it really gets down to are these last two, though. How is my product different? What makes it different, unique, special? And what is my unique selling proposition? How do I uniquely bring value to my customers? Why is it that someone would want to come to me to buy the food that I'm selling as opposed to going to the guy across the aisle or down the road? So let's look at some of the ways that we can differentiate. Next, please. Here are some slides of uh, farmer's market uh, tables that give us some ideas about product decisions and product differentiation. On the left is a table full of potatoes. and. Um, what I thought was nice about this is that this farmer has taken three different varieties and colors of potatoes and has put them together in clear bags so that there's this beautiful rainbow effect of the potatoes. I think that's a creative packaging idea and helps, helps the product to be unique. I can buy one bag and get three varieties. The upper right hand shows uh, maple syrups. Again, unique packaging here, very, very unusually shaped bottles with tags beautiful with the sun coming through it and uh, making that a very distinctive product. Probably I would be willing to pay considerably more for that than for maple syrup in a quart, quart canning jar with the top on, which is how I'm seeing sometimes maple syrup sold. So this probably could command a much better price. And in the lower right, very simple. Just the way the boxes are, are arranged helps the colors to just be very, very bright and vivid in these peaches and blueberries. So different ways of highlighting products. Next, please. Um, one of the things that the Hartman Group came out with in their uh, research, 
I thought it had value for all of us. Now, they were asking people questions that helped them to put together this list of things that they said an ideal organic package would include. Keep in mind, they were talking about a package that might be in a grocery store, perhaps with processed food. But I think that the components are ones that no matter how you're selling, you can incorporate many of these into your package and what frames your package, uh, the, material, the marketing materials that you develop. First of all, that mission statement. Remember we talked about that earlier. And that kind of is a core of who you are and you're communicating with that mission to your customer. Um, your marketing should foster a personal connection. How can you do that? Well, you might want to include your name. You might want to include photographs of your farm, of the product. You might want to have times for people to come to the farm. You might want to have information on your website that tells about you and your family. But ways to help your customer understand who you are. The third uh, component is high quality product imagery. Now, product imagery, pictures of the product. And I think that um, some of the photos that I'm showing you show pretty high quality product imagery. But if you have beautiful products, one of the best ways to market them is by showing people how beautiful they really are. Um, highlighting your production methods is something that is, you can all do and it's, it's important. Again, people don't necessarily know just because you're selling organic food what that means in terms of how it's produced so you can help them understand what you do and what you don't do to produce the food. Showing the raw ingredients is probably relevant only with a processed product, but you may be doing that and it's important that you do show the raw ingredients. Again, show the farm, tell its story, have pictures, give a little history of the farm. Show and tell specific product attributes. Let people know varieties, how to prepare, how to store, what it tastes like, things like that. And finally, show your certifications. If you are certified organic, put that certificate right up where people can see it on your stall, on your website, uh, so that people know that you're certified. But thinking of those components can, I think, be helpful to everyone as we're thinking about how to communicate with customers. Next, please. Okay, we're moving to the third P of place. Now, place has to do, again, with where and how your products are available. So you have to decide at some point, are you going to sell at the farmer's market through a CSA, or a farmer roadside stand, other places? What combination of markets are you going to use? Those are your places. Uh, online ordering may be another possibility, or home delivery. I think another way to think about place has to do with time, and maybe there are opportunities for you to sell year-round to expand the place by the time of your sales. I think place has has something to say to us, too, about the way in which you accept payment. Um, do you accept payment via credit or debit card? Um, if not, that may be limiting your sales, because increasingly people aren't carrying around a lot of cash or checks with them. Do you sell products via SNAP, that's, that is the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, via FMPP, the Farmer's Market Promotion Program, card, or coupons? All of those are ways to think about place. Next, please. Here's a unique place, and I put this in more for fun than everything else. Have you ever heard of a drive through farmer's market? Well, one of our communities in Michigan tried one uh, a couple years back, and um, they got advertising even on the McDonald's billboard, and they posted all the, um, the foods on a, on a blackboard, and people placed their order and came through. Probably not something you do all the time, but it sure created interest, and it was a very unique place and way for people to market food. Next, please. I think um, if you're looking to expand your market, you should definitely take a serious look at um, ways to accept plastic in the market. Again, um, you can talk with your bank specifically about Visa, MasterCard, Discover, credit and debit cards, and find out what it would take for you to accept them. Or if you're selling at a farmer's market, the market may make those arrangements for you, or you might want to encourage the market master to think about that. Um, the card on the left of the four at the sign at the top is a Michigan Bridge card. 
that's the card that people who get uh, supplemental nutrition assistance program benefits, which we used to call food stamps. That's the card that they use. It's also a card that looks just like that is also the card used by people who are part of the WIC program, Women, Infants, and Children. Now, our state's had huge unemployment over the last few years, and the number of people who are using food assistance programs like these has increased dramatically. If, as a farmer, I don't make arrangements to be able to accept payment via the bridge card, I am um, excluding a large percentage of people in my market area from ever shopping at my stall. So though there is a bit of paperwork involved in uh, accepting these, and in some cases some expense, I think it's important to really look at these as, as important options for expanding your market and for making your great food available to people who could really use it. Next, please. We're moving on to price now. And again, remember we said price is really the value that customers place on your products and services. And I'm not going to say a whole lot about price. We could have a whole separate webinar on knowing your costs and setting your prices. But the kind of some key things that are really important for you to remember as you're developing your market plan and, and the rest of your business planning is that the value that your customers place on your products and services must be greater than your costs. That's the only way you're going to stay in business. You have to manage your costs and you have to manage your customers' perceptions of your products. And if that value isn't enough greater than your costs, you need to look on one or both ends to make that a bigger gap so that you can stay in business. To do that, it's really important that you know your costs and that you know how much profit you want or need to make. Those are things you need to be putting in your, in your plan up front so that you know what you have to do during the year and you can monitor your progress during that year. Next, please. We can't really talk about price, I think, today without talking a bit about the impacts of the economy. Um, on October 13th, there was a great article in the New York Times that talked about eco meets the economy. And it was really talking about the impacts of the economy on, on green goods and services. And I want to just pull a few quotes from that article. Um, one was from the executive vice president of the Organic Trade Association, who said, of the organic goods sector has boomed in the last eight years, going up to $29 billion from $9 billion in sales. The industry's yearly growth dropped to less than 6% in 2010 from between 15 and 20% previously. That's quite a drop. We're glad it's still growing, but the, the rate of growth certainly dramatically slowed in 2010. I haven't seen specific figures for this year, but um, from what I'm seeing generally in the economy, I'm guessing it's not going to be a whole lot different this year. Next, please. Another uh, person quoted in the article said, for me it's a matter of choosing what should be bought organic and what isn't as crucial. This person said that she's now saving money by buying organically grown produce only if it's on the so-called dirty dozen list. That's a list of the dozen fruits and vegetables that are most susceptible to absorbing pesticides. So that's one, um, that's one way of coping with an inability to buy as much as, as people want. So you might be thinking about what you sell, which of those are going to be most important for people to buy, even if they can't buy everything they want to. Next, please. Another person interviewed in the article said, I have to prioritize my spending. Not long ago, this gentleman found himself in a grocery store trying to decide between $10 a pound organic bacon and a non-organic brand that, that was five. In the end, he didn't buy either one. More and more people are doing that. He said it's like buy nothing day all year. So that's kind of what we're up against is people want products but sometimes can't purchase what they want. Next, please. One last example was one of a family who used to buy organic produce but now couldn't afford the produce so they were, buy, were, were uh, growing and preserving vegetables and fruits themselves. Now, again, this, this may lead to a market opportunity. Um, if you can't sell people the fruits and vegetables, maybe you can sell them the transplants and help them to um, get what they want, but in a different way. So I think I don't have all the answers for the economy that we're facing. It is very challenging for many people, but I think it's important to consider how that's affecting your customers 
And in light of those impacts, think about what you can do to help them and to keep your business going. Next, please. Now, another thing about price that I think is essential is let people know what the prices are. Communicate the prices. Use signage. Um, make sure that it's very clear what things cost. People are not likely, most people are not likely to ask you how much something costs. If it's not marked, they'll figure they can't afford it and they'll walk right on by. So use signs. Here are some examples of pricing. Um, but make sure everything that you, that you sell, whether it's at a farmer's market, a farm stand, or some other way, is clearly marked with the price. Next, please. Our last P is promotion. Um, we often, when we think of marketing promotion, is what we really think of. But um, there are lots of other parts, as I hope I've shown you. Promotion, though, can include things like um, outreach that might be advertising or brochures or building your mailing list. It can include on-site marketing, like signs and merchandising and recipes and information, collaboration with other businesses, media relationships, special events, a calendar. Those are some of the possible components of promotion. Next, please. Some sort of random thoughts about promotion. First and foremost, use, first have a website, and second, put your website URL everywhere. Post it at your farmer's market stall, put it on all your business cards, your brochures, all your promotional materials. You can't be open 24-7, but your website can be, and that's where you should put information so people can find out all about you. Signage is really important as well. And be sure that the quality of your signs is up to the quality of your products. They, your signs do say a lot about your products and how you think of them. And signs for every product, and I'm thinking about farmer's market and roadside stands especially here, but they all should include the name of the product, its price, and try to come up with three benefits or tips about the product to help people know about the product. We'll see some examples of those in a few slides. Next, please. I mentioned signage. And remember earlier in that um, components of an organic package that good quality product images were on that list. I thought you might like to see these great signs. They were developed by Amanda Edmonds and her crew at the Ypsilanti Farmers Market and show beautiful photos of produce and a great background to advertise the farmer's market. So you could use examples of signs like these to promote your own business in some interesting ways, I think. Next, please. It's important that, as I mentioned earlier, you use those tips about the product to show customers how to use your product and how it was grown and that you help to develop that relationship with your customers and part by wearing a name tag themselves. You want people to say, I bought it from Vicki, not I bought it from that woman whose stall is two, two, two aisles down at the farmer's market. Here are a couple of examples. The one on the right, handmade, pretty simple, but I think effective. Um, colorful, crisp, assorted peppers, and there is the price. Doesn't tell us a lot about the product, but at least it gets in the colorful and the crisp and the assorted. On the left, a little bit more detail. Um, again, pretty simple, but it gives the name of the product, tells that it was grown uh, in a, it's certified organically, gives the price, and talks about ways to use and why that product is good for you. Those are really easy things to do. Do them this winter. Get those all set before the season starts, and you'll find, I think, that, that, that they'll be very useful to you. Next, please. Here's some additional examples of some other signage that I think is, is nice. Up on the left, I think that um, I, you can see that that's um, been laminated, so that those arugula signs can be just clipped on the container and uh, used throughout the season. Um, on the bottom, again, some signs, pretty simple. Um, they give information about the product or show you what it is. I like the look of the little blackboard signs on the right. I think uh, in, in the right stall, that, that can really add a lot to the ambiance of the stall. Next, please. Here is a, an attractive sign and an absolutely gorgeous product and a missed opportunity. Um, what can I do with Swiss chard? What does it taste like? How long will it keep? 
that, uh, that sign has plenty of room for some product features, some product benefits, and they, they should be there. It's a missed opportunity, and it means some missed sales. Next, please. Now, I've, I've shown you what I think are some gorgeous signs, but they can be pretty basic and still get the job done. In the marketing workshops that we do, do here in Michigan, we very often pass out little index cards and markers and ask everyone to create a sign that includes a product name, a price, a graphic element, and one or more product benefits or features. Then we collect all the, all the cards and uh, let the participants vote on which one's best. Here's an assortment from one of the workshops that we did. So these were just really quickly made on the spur of the moment. But again, they can communicate the idea, and you could use something like these um, if you're really stretched for uh, time and budget. Next, please. There are lots of ways to provide information to your customers. These gardening gloves that are stuffed with gravel, I think, really liven up all the paper on this table. And I think they make a great way to kind of get some humor into the, into the stall and into the sales area. Next, please. As you design your farmer's market stall or your CSA pickup site or your roadside stand, think of ways that you can communicate with customers and highlight your products. This sign is effective and it hides clutter that might be under the table. Um, notice that some of the transplants on the table are elevated so they're up near eye eyes level so you can see them better. Um, this display would be even more effective just by tipping up the trays of, of products that are sitting on the table and blocking them up in the back so that they tilt slightly toward the customer and the customers can see them better. Believe it or not, I've given this advice for a lot of years and I've had vendors come back to me and tell me when they just did that one change, it actually did increase their sales. Next, please. Your banners and signs are really important. I thought these were attractive ones. Um, getting those banners and signs up as high as you can can help people find you, and that can be really important. Next, please. Consider, if, you have, if you're in the market for a pop-up, consider getting one that's customized with your farm name and logo that you see at the top here. Now, printed corrugated boxes that are shown on the bottom two slides may be beyond your scope, but how about farm stickers to put on the packages that you sell so people know where the product comes from? Next, please. Again, professional artwork is great, but do-it-yourself can work as well. Um, these are examples of signage and information that were made by the farmers, and I think that they're all effective. I especially like the, the tent at the bottom showing the different cuts of meat and where they come from. A great way to educate consumers. Next, please. Here are a few examples of some more signs. Now, two of them do include right on their big signs and product attributes, which is, which is really great. The other uh, double Crestwood Farm sign just uh, has farm name products and prices, but is a good way for this kind of product of really showing what's available. Next, please. Promotion is a lot about engaging the senses, and we do this with sight all the time, but look for ways to go beyond just sight. Offer samples if you can do so legally. Find ways for people to enjoy the fragrance of ripe fruit and let customers feel the products. Next, please. Re regularly consider your product mix. It may not make sense to carry the same assortment of vegetables as everyone else in the market. You might think about going broader by adding some unusual items. That might help you. Or you might think about narrowing your product line and specializing in some things that you can do particularly well. Focus on the products that do best for you, that draw customers and that you can grow well, and that you sell well with reasonable profit margins, and see what you can do by expanding on them. Next, please. Learn effective display techniques. Look at windows that you think are attractive. Look for props that you can use to add to and make your food look good. And, um, Play around with your display techniques because how you show the food can make a huge difference. Now, that kind of brings us through our five Ps and a plan, and we're about at the time. Next slide, please. 
So we've talked very quickly through these tips and the ideas for developing a marketing plan. I really encourage you to take time now to develop a plan and to use it through 2012. It doesn't have to be long. You can probably do it in two pages, and one of those is going to be all budget and schedule. Um, it doesn't have to be expensive. Um, it, you, could, you can do a reasonable marketing plan if you have time to invest for probably a couple hundred dollars a year. I hope this webinar helps you to get underway, and I thank you very much for being with us today.